cutting way over like five seconds. Excellent. That's usually my catchphrase to start uh, to start an interview. But I like that you did it this time. We both did it. Anyways, Jason, welcome to the Honey Badger Diaries. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, we've never met in real life or anything. We don't know each other. Maybe we can start with that. So who are you? So, um, so I run a. Uh, my name is Jason. I run a community, um, a small community in Malaysia called Bitcoin Malaysia. We have a group of about fifty-six thousand people um, uh, that was built since two zero one two. So this group is called Bitcoin Malaysia. Started really small. Uh, started as a simple blog website where people can get information about. Bitcoin about um, how to get it, how to mine it. Now that I have it, what do I do with it? Okay, and over the years, okay, um, we have grown the the community organically to become the largest uh, community group that we have in our country today. So uh, I came into the space like three years ago, S quite similar to um, a lot of people. Okay, um, at the time when. Everybody was talking about Bitcoin, but I came in more because I was interested in this, um, in the technology behind it. I was very curious. My my background actually, I don't have a computer science background, Aaron. I don't have a, a cryptography background as well. Um, my story actually uh, started with I'm actually from the solar power industry. So what mm -hmm. I used to do is I used to install solar panels. Okay, uh, I used to run a solar power company for eight years. I install solar panels for a living mm -hmm. in my country, um, and I got really interested. Okay, at this thing called Bitcoin, which basically incentivized a lot of people to uh, consume a lot of electricity to earn this carrot. Okay, in the form of Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. it got me really, really. Uh, keen to to just I, I was just having this idea what if I could use okay if I could use this technology to solve problems in the thing that I care about mm -hmm. which is the environment and helping the environment so that that was how I got into the space I got into the space by joining a, uh, a blockchain consultancy here in Southeast Asia and it so happened was um, uh, Colbert, who referred me to you, okay, uh, and is the founder of Bitcoin Malaysia. He um, he was the director of the company. Mm -hmm. So back then, okay, that was my my entry point, okay, into this rabbit hole. And uh, it was very funny because three years ago, okay, when people saw me walking around with Colbert, okay, who was this OG, okay, very low key, down to earth OG in the space. A lot of people thought that oh, this Jason must he have must have a lot of bitcoins, or he knows a lot of things about cryptocurrency. The truth is actually no, I I, I knew nothing about cryptocurrency. Um, but and truth be told as well, it took me about like eight eight months to really make sense of what's going on. I was just quietly just doing work, learning the ropes behind the scenes, just absorbing and trying to piece everything together mm -hmm. and um so and, eight, and, eight months? and and this is eight months eight months to, I've, I've been there almost eight years and i'm still trying to figure it out exactly all right so that that is the truth okay i i i find that this space is a space where um every three months if i look back and i, I feel like i've learned so much do you agree okay there's so much okay um, to actually learn, but at the same time, back then, um, because it, it was like really really difficult to 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 learn this stuff. It was very difficult to learn about cryptocurrency, and I was working on it on a daily basis. I felt that there are a lot of people who would feel the same way that I did, which is it's very scary. It's very difficult. And it's very confusing back then as well because in 2017 and 2018, um, there was so much hype, and I, I don't know who was real, who was fake, who was legit, mm -hmm. who was full of shit. It was a very, very confusing time. People were just spending, you know, and 
um, it, just very hard to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, okay, um, back then, was I decided what if I can take what I what took me eight months to learn, right? At least the basics, things like things that we already know, like not your keys, not your coins, basic stuff. Uh, why does crypto have value? Okay, very, very simple stuff. And basically condense it into something simple and easy to understand that in, in one or two hours, take eight months to one or two hours. So I've been doing, so that was how I actually dis, um, that I decided how I would I wanted to contribute to the space. So over the last three years, I've delivered a hundred talks, okay, throughout the country. A um, hundred what? A hundred talks. Talks, yeah, okay. For for beginners, okay. Um, what is this thing called Bitcoin? Why does it matter? Why why is it different? Okay, why does it still be around? What is this thing? Okay, why is it that governments are paying so much attention to it right now? These kinds of um awareness building and the most important thing is how to tell what is real and versus what is fake mm -hmm. um so yeah i over the last three years okay uh without realizing in 2018 i um i delivered 25 talks and i i didn't it wasn't by kind of like i wanted to do it it's kind of like by accident it's kind of like that and then because i realized that i, I could do it then I, I told myself what if i could do 50 next last year and then i did it i did 51 and then this year uh, we had a really really strong start we um we were doing once a month events okay in uh, in in the city right uh and we had the largest meetup uh we ever had for the first event for the year we had 100 people and uh 70 percent of them were new faces which is what we actually that that is what success looks like to me because the goal of what our community what we feel that our community uh group can play is to provide a safe and friendly and neutral important as well neutral place where people can can learn about crypto so this is what i've been doing okay over the last three years now um it's been very difficult during this COVID period because um all the events all got cancelled okay uh, for obvious reasons um but i i we are still working really hard to keep up the momentum right now over the last four weeks okay um we have delivered uh uh i think i've delivered about like uh eight eight webinars so far and we went right. through a lot of problems and things like that converting so um yeah th this that's a that's a um a uh, quick introduction. I'm sorry if it's very long, but yeah, yeah. An introduction so you're ca you're the you're the Andreas Antonopoulos of Malaysia. That's, that's I, the I story like in a nutshell. <laughs> so that's so kind of you to say. It was Andreas Antonopoulos that inspired me to do what I do. How is the how is Bitcoin doing in Malaysia? Is it is it catching on at all? What's what's the story? I would say that um, a lot. There's a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, in Malaysia, okay. Number one, Malaysia is kind of like a mixed bag. Okay, we have this huge community. Um, out of fifty-six thousand people, twenty-two thousand of them are active weekly. Mm -hmm. I would say, but it, it did take a long time to build this community. A lot of these people, okay, in the community are also the the how do I say the OGs, right? They've been in the crypto space. They know what 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 things are. Um. Malaysia is the home to Etherscan. Malaysia is the home to Etherscan. Malaysia is the home to CoinGecko, right? Um, so we have, you know, like a, a lot of, how do I say, very interesting. Uh, we have like top global companies who are Malaysians, right? Okay, in the country. Uh, but also we have a lot of scams. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that uh, in the last three years, one of the biggest um very very powerful scams was this thing called bit club network okay they they had a yeah, mining yeah. Group, right yes. and, and recently okay that they were really strong in malaysia okay mm -hmm. it was very difficult okay to but i'm very happy okay that um there's some kind of closure to it last year the, um i think in november 
uh, Coin Telegraph reported that the Department of Justice of the U.S. caught the founders. And when that happened, the whole house of cards fell. And right now, it it is um, how I would say that uh, yeah, I would say that money games. Okay, uh, we call it money games in Malaysia, uh, Ponzi's and whatnot. I think that they have quieted down. Okay, a bit. There's still a lot of the smaller, smaller, obvious ones still going on about um, cloud mining, all these you know uh, things. But um, I think we have an opportunity to basically turn turn the, the thing. That's why we're working really hard right now to uh, you know grow grow the community and uh, get the proper education out there. Um, yeah. In terms of regulation, okay, it's also very interesting because um, last year the government of Malaysia decided to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies by starting with the cryptocurrency exchanges. Right. So um, last year, and part of the reason of that is because last year in January, we had like 49 uh, companies in Malaysia who were like offering um, trading platforms and stuff like that. Right. And um, I think the volumes, okay, were uh, something that they were concerned about. So what happened was last year in January, uh, the government uh, came out some regulatory guidelines they passed the mandate to the Securities Commission. They they said that in Malaysia, all crypto assets, including Bitcoin, Ether, are securities. Okay, mm -hmm. and we'll come, and um, the first thing that they regulated was the uh, the exchanges. When that happened, out of forty nine companies, twenty seven dropped out in February. They decided no, we're not going to we're we're going to stop. Right, and twenty two. Uh, uh, wrote into the the government and said that we would like to legally operate in Malaysia. Fast forward, okay. Uh, by June, out of the twenty two companies, only three companies got a pre approval license, right? And they were given like nine months to uh, comply to all the the rules, mostly about anti money laundering and uh, counter uh, terrorism financing. Mm -hmm. And when and I'm very happy to inform right now that. Uh, all three companies, Synergy, Luno, and Tokenize, uh, are fully operational already. The first one that got it was Luno in November, and Synergy and Tokenize they got their approval in this month, early this month on April first. Not an April Fool's joke, seriously on April first. And um, this to me is uh, it's a good milestone for our country because for the first time. Um, there is now a place where people can legally buy Bitcoin Ether because people feel more safer. Okay, uh, I think this is a good thing. Is this also what your pinned tweet, tweet is about? It says, your pinned tweet says that Access Malaysia is the reason why our government did not ban cryptocurrencies with an iron fist two years ago. Is this the same thing or something else? Yeah. So Access Blockchain Association is the interface, okay, is an association, okay, um, formed by the industry um, to basically uh, interface with the government. I think Access Blockchain did a very good job in the sense that three years ago, I remember fewer people know about what cryptocurrencies are and what blockchain and what distributed ledgers were, right? and. I remember that there was a time when it was very, very easy for them to just take the convenient way and say that we don't know what this is, we don't, uh, and then just basically did an outright ban. I think mm -hmm. that was like 2017, 2018. So it was because, okay, I think it, at the same time in 2017, uh, we modeled after our neighbor country, Singapore, which had the Access Blockchain Association that. We basically took their model, okay, borrowed it, and we uh, we engage okay with the the regulators in the same way. So I think that that was uh, that was a uh, uh, they were a they played a huge part, okay, in getting to where we are today. So the government wants us to ban it, and Access Malaysia stop that. Is... I would I would say that they played a huge role in that. Yes, exactly. 
All right, let's get to what is the situation in Malaysia right now? Are you in lockdown? We are still in lockdown. Okay. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, as to when this would end. Okay, for our country, um, the lockdown, the due date of the lockdown is actually next Tuesday. So a lot of people are looking forward to actually, uh, you know, have the lockdown lifted so that they can get back to work. They can get things done, you know. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in lockdown? Today's, I think, the 35th day. 35th day, so over a month. So over a month. And what does that um, look like? Can you leave your home at all? or We, can't, we, we, we can leave our home for the groceries, okay? Mm. Um, I think that there's a rule that uh, you can't drive more than 10 kilometers out of your house. Mm -hmm. So basically that that is kind of like the rule so mm. if you if you travel out then usually that there will be some roadblocks and some police that they will find you okay if you if you actually don't have a good reason for traveling at this time right and is malaysia trying to suppress the virus to, to remove it from the country as much as possible a little more like surrounding countries oh. like singapore or is it accepting that most people will get it like the sort of herd immunity thing or so the, the current situation right now uh, i remember about four weeks ago um when at the start of the lockdown we had about like a hundred new reported cases a day so we had mm -hmm. like a hundred new reported cases a day on the second week of the lockdown the numbers were frightening because it was around 200 a day mm -hmm. so, um today we are back down to two digit so mm -hmm. i think that we are having like 50 50 i think yesterday's numbers was like 35 new cases a day right so we could see that there is flattening of the curse and this is bearing in mind okay based on official official sources of course there's a lot of people who are not happy okay with the data and all that but just based on official sources okay it looks like the numbers are improving However, there's still a lot of uncertainty, okay, as to um, even if, let's say, for example, um, even even though, for example, if they were to lift the, the, the ban next week, the, um, the, there, is, there is fear that, okay, that there might be a second wave because um, that's what happened to Singapore. Right now, I think uh, the number of cases, okay, in Singapore, um, the, the that's happening right now is uh, is growing quite an alarming rate and uh, uh, we don't know we, we really really don't know yeah but it does sound like at least the strategy is to try to suppress the virus as much as possible if the country is still in lockdown with only double digit new cases yeah and I get and I'm guessing there's a is there a travel restriction can people enter the country do they have yeah, to go people, into can't, people, people can't enter the country people can't exit the country all flights are basically i think that um there are exceptional cases basically those people who are malaysians they're trying to go and bring them back and that's it yeah right so yeah it sounds like this sort of uh, asian strategy i guess do you want to discuss this more or should we discuss sun power and power Solar power what's that and power so um we can talk anything you like, Aaron. Um, thank you for asking. Well, about do, you, do, you, do you have a do you have any sort of perspectives on the whole Corona thing you want to share? The whole lockdown thing, because otherwise we can talk about Sun Power. I know very little about Sun Power, and I want to learn more. So, um, uh, let's see. Um, on the subject matter of a uh, Corona, I think that there are a few silver linings, right? Okay, that I learned from this uh, lockdown. Mm -hmm. The first thing, okay, is that um, we, by, by having more people, okay, who embrace connecting via online as a new mm -hmm. way of uh, communicating, I feel that we, um, uh, it forced me, it forced me to scale up, to tool up, to scale up, um, and 
what I like about it is that now by doing by taking what I've already done offline, okay, uh, and doing it online. Number one, I can do it more frequently. Um, number two, I'm able to access. Okay, now I'm, one of the things I'm really happy about is that um, people who normally don't have access to our um, talks, they get access. I'm talking about people five hours away from the city. You know, right? Um, people from so we have different different states. Okay, and now now we are able to reach out to them. So, well, didn't and, you previously film your talks? That's what a lot of speakers do as well. Right. So that's one problem that I have. I am camera shy. So I have done a hundred talks, and one of the biggest struggles is not because of what not, but um. Yeah, uh, I, I have this uh, challenge that I need to overcome. Um, You're so, fine with a stage, but not a camera. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, a little I bit, yeah. It. It's, it's kind of like the reverse. I'm, I'm actually okay with uh, speaking on stage, but I'm trying to get used to talking about a camera. But uh, yeah, this is what it is right now. We we need yeah. to adjust. We need to 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 um. We need to adjust. Yeah, I think a lot of people are finding that now they are sort of forced to do things differently. That they actually kind of like doing it differently. You know, working from home is an obvious example. Yeah, working from home. Okay. Um. Uh. So a lot of people, you know, at the beginning, even myself, I had a lot of self doubt. Um. When uh. You know, basically, people just don't like change. People just don't like change. Mm -hmm. So um, the first two weeks, okay, of the lockdown was um, particularly stressful for me because I'm number one, I'm forced to change, and I don't know whether am I able to deliver the same kind of thing. And people also question. They say that Jason, am I able to learn? Okay, um, am I able to learn? Okay, what we're able to learn uh, as effectively as a face to face. Kind of uh, um, you know, like a learning session. Sure. So, um, but we we just completed our first full day webinar for crypto cryptocurrency for beginners on April 11. It was a Saturday. We divided it into four modules. the uh, The first two modules was all about how to protect yourself, how not to lose your crypto, how to store it safely, not your keys, not your coins, your fundamentals of money right and then in the afternoon was basically more about um, capturing the opportunities exploring what is available in crypto and we had really really good feedback so that was a huge confidence booster you know um, that uh, it's just a matter of um, making it work and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and trying and failing and um, yeah it, it has been tough <laughs> Um, Aaron, just want to ask you, you you do this more often, I suppose. Um, you've been doing this a long time. What exactly? Uh, podcasts and uh, interviewing people online. No, I've I've just started this podcast. This is uh, this is something I'm sort of learning myself. But it's a it's more of a hobby thing right now. I'm in lockdown and I'm I kind of you know it's called the Honey Badger Diaries. I I quite literally see it as sort of a diary just kind of keeping track of what I'm doing and, and what other people are doing. And I think it will be fun to listen back to in 10 years from now. That's that's the idea. I'm not really aspiring this to be a new career or anything. It's just something to do while while, while I'm stuck in my home. Uh, I see. What what do you actually do then? Or no, or I've, 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 I'm the technical editor at Bitcoin Magazine. So I do interview people, just not live. I usually interview people about projects they're working on, and then I translate that into mm -hmm. a text that's hopefully understandable for, uh, I'd say, a bigger group of people than the sort of initial group of developers that that understand the technical explanation. And then I kind of translated it into something a little more, a little bit more understandable. And this is just this is a hobby project I do on the side. It it kills my own boredom, and uh, and whoever wants to listen in can listen in. And hey, let's get to solar power because I I know very little about solar power and I want to learn more. 
All your, right. Your your Twitter bio says, "I believe in two things. I believe in a future where solar power is a common thing for you and me, and I believe in Bitcoin." So I believe in a future where solar power is a common thing for you and me. What is it? Required to get there. How do we get there, Jason? I think that the number one thing that needs to happen, okay, is that the solar power price, the solar panel prices need to come down. Okay, okay. why are they high? <clears throat> they are high because adoption de demand is low. Why is demand It, low? Does demand, it anyone? Demand is low because um, people, uh, because the current technology that we have available is um, inefficient. And I think that it's really an incentivization problem. It really is an incentivization problem. Okay, so currently, right, if you look at solar panel technology, okay, it's boring. Um, okay, so there's a, some pros and some cons here, right? Number one, solar panel technology is as old as a dinosaur. The, the products that we that we use that are commercially available today, they don't look very different from the kind of products that we had 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. There are still monocrystalline solar panels, polycrystalline solar panels, and they are roughly about like um, the. If you're lucky, you can get something like you know a, a Tesla, you know uh, Elon Musk. They have their brand of solar panels. If you're lucky, you can get a 20% efficient solar panel, right? Mm -hmm. But most solar panels in the world is between 10, 10%, okay, and uh, 15 and 13% efficient. And usually, okay, the, the problem is that currently the on a um, how do hang I on, say? Hang on, hang on. You have let me make this clear for myself. I'm assuming that's for example, these solar power, these solar solar panels, excuse me, that are sort of yeah. stuck on satellites that yeah. are built by NASA. These must yeah. be the best solar powers in existence. Yes, this must. And, these are the best solar panels in existence, and I believe that uh, those are roughly around 50%, 50% fifty percent, fifty percent efficient, fifty percent efficient. Five zero. Five so, zero. And then, it, and then the solar powers you have on your own roof, they are much less efficient. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. They are much less efficient, okay, and um, yeah, between five times, okay, uh, less efficient. Right, and is that because they're much, much cheaper to produce? Yes, okay. Right. Older technology, the things that scale, okay, are definitely much more cheaper to produce. So the, the problem is this, okay, um, when, when uh, what's that, when, Currently, okay, if let's say, for example, um, you wanted to install solar panels for, say, say, if you wanted to install solar panels on your house, the normal person, they would think of it like, okay, I'm saving energy, but how much does it cost and is it worth it to do it? That, that is mm -hmm. what it is. So the current, okay, uh, If you install, say, for example, okay, a solar power system on your house, say if your electricity bill is a hundred bucks a month, all right? If your solar electricity, if your electricity bill a month is a hundred bucks, and then somebody comes to you and gives you a proposal, install solar panels, it costs ten thousand bucks. How long does it take for you to make back your ten thousand bucks? You save a hundred bucks a month, right? So it take a hundred months, okay, for you to make back your money. Mm -hmm. So that's roughly about uh, six to seven years, right? Six to seven years, and a lot of people they rather buy Bitcoin. Let's let's put it something like that, right? They uh, what's that? The, so the Bitcoin is the problem. Bitcoin is to no, blame no, no. for not. No 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I'm saying that okay, but the, the mindset of people is that okay, they, they look at ROI, they look at ROI, okay, they, they look at wh what is it okay, money today, I have money today, do I buy solar panels or do I go and put my money in and buy something else? Mm -hmm. And one thing I I learned okay the hard way in um, living in Malaysia and a developing country as well is that. 
we we people don't care about the environment here. Um, I'm I'm saying this loosely, all right. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it is an uncomfortable truth, but it's not because we don't really like. Nobody's going to say that we don't care about the environment, but the reality is is that people's priorities are just different here in 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 in, in Asia. Mm-hmm. In Asia, okay, especially a developing nation, most people's okay. We're not a rich country. Um, our number one goal is to provide food for our families, and uh, and if we can earn more money, is to provide better food, better house, better cars. And if we can earn more money, okay, then we would put that money to in- invest and get more money. And if we have more money, we would like to take our family on a holiday. It's as simple as that. So when you ask people, okay, to to invest to take whatever sum of money, and ten thousand is usually a lot of money, right? To buy solar panels, okay, for the house, that usually comes when you already are there, you're already rich, and these are just like excessive money. Fine, I would like to help the environment, and this represents a very very small, uh, tiny bit. Now, something very interesting happened during my eight years running a solar power company, which was between the year two zero, uh, between two zero zero eight and two zero one six, right? Um, our country had one of the best government incentives in the world, and how it happened was that if you had solar panels on your roof. You could sell the electricity from the solar panels at five times the price of electricity to the government. Mm-hmm. Then, when that happened, okay, suddenly this becomes like a money-making machine. All right, what that means is that if your house is say you have an electricity bill of a hundred bucks a month, right? Okay, uh, and you install solar panels, then what? Uh, you if you had solar panels. You could generate a five hundred dollar income, passive income a month, right? And you 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 are free to do whatever you want. You can pay your bill, the hundred baht, and then you have four hundred profits there. Mm-hmm. So it reduces the ROI, okay? From you know, um, from from uh, what's that? Uh, how many how many years? Much much shorter. And it was uh, it was a very very. I remember that the first year. Okay, I remember when the the government introduced this incentive. Uh, the first year, people were like, "Jason, don't con me, don't scam me, got such thing, man." You know, uh, uh, where got some? Where, why would the electricity company, okay, pay me uh, for the solar electricity and at five times the rate? Okay, uh, but when the first year. When the first adopters started to make money, instantly the people just basically jumped into it already. Mm-hmm. Um, because so, but this like, was this was the government subsidy essentially they were receiving so taxpayer money. You're right. Actually, okay. So so here's the thing. All right. So that's a very good question. So. <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but now my it's fine. Um, so because it's public information anyway, okay, just people don't know about it. So basically, okay, a very good question to ask is why would the government, uh, why would the electricity companies buy back electricity at five times the price, okay, of you know electricity? That's loss making venture. The answer is it's not a loss making venture. The answer is, it's not the electricity company's money, and it's also not the government's money. The government collects taxes; they are not taking it from that. What they did was even, how do I say, more clever. What they did was that they took an additional two、uh, percent. They charged the entire country an additional two percent on electricity bills. And、uh, so they passed a law. Okay, I remember it was the year two zero one one. They passed the law called the Renewable Energy,、uh, Renewable Energy Act.、Mm-hmm. The Renewable Energy Act was、uh, a, a quite significant, in my opinion, for a couple of reasons. Number one, for the first time, it allowed anyone to sell electricity. Before that, 
only uh, Malaysia was is a monopoly and still is okay in terms of electricity uh, generation distribution and whatnot. Mm. Only this one company, licensee holders, can generate electricity in the country and sell electricity. So for mm. the first time, this renewable energy act allows anyone. Okay, it can be um, uh, 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 not only just only uh, citizens. It can it allows PR residents. Okay, to basically um, uh, generate and then be part of this. So that was the first thing, but it. The way that they did it was that it the the law, uh, the law, uh, uh introduced okay um, the creation of a fund, a renewable energy fund, and that fund would come by collecting two percent from everybody's electricity bills, like additional. So, the the electricity company TMB collects roughly about like thirty billion, uh, Malaysian ringgit, thirty mm. billion ringgit. Uh, a year of electricity bills. So by collecting two percent more, they are collecting about six hundred million. They have a six million dollar fund. So if you okay uh, install solar panels and you're and you're making five hundred ringgit a month, mm -hmm. six thousand a year, that six thousand comes from this six hundred million. It does not come from the electricity companies. It does not come from the government's money. Right. That's how they did it. So they're t they're taxing dirty energy and. Incentivizing clean energy is that a good way to put so, it? That one way to put it as well. They are taxing right. okay dirty energy. However, the of course, you know, it, of course, it could it couldn't work for everyone. Like it could only work if there's a minority producing some uh, solar power, right? Yes. So I think that um, there are a few things that I'm not happy about. A lot of people are not happy when when people. The, the, the smart thing that the government did was that they did it in a way that people actually don't know. If I throw a rock and I told that, do you know that pe that you're paying 2% a month? People don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the good thing also is that it, this, what the government did, it created an industry. It really, really just boosted the industry because suddenly, okay, right. people were buying solar panels. Right, and then they were like, uh, I remember um, during my time, okay, at least that there were like 300 to 500 new solar power companies, okay, in the country Be because of uh, this uh, period of uh, relative prosperity, right? Um, but the, you, can, you can argue, okay, that uh, the government should. At least you know take two percent from the the people and then back it up with another two percent match it with another two percent all these kind of thing okay but unfortunately what happened uh, Aaron is that in two zero one six the government um, stopped uh, this incentive program mm. the government stopped Why? this incentive program in two zero one six because they claim that the six hundred million that they're collecting a year has been fully allocated. But the numbers don't make sense to me because allocated to what? So um, they claim that it's fully allocated, which means that um, uh, so say for example, if you install solar panels, right? Okay, you need to apply first. You need to apply to the government and says that I would like to install so many solar panels, right? Mm -hmm. And then you give your form pass and whatnot, and then the government gives you a, a license. Okay, they will issue you a an approval and a license to say that okay your house can sell electricity right so when that happens you are allocated okay the budget say you you're earning you're selling 500 a month 6000 a year okay your job is to basically produce the electricity which is it's easy that's the easy part because solar engineering is very very mature okay um uh yeah so if you're selling 6000 a year then that six thousand is allocated for you out of six hundred million. The government claimed that this six hundred million has been fully allocated, and therefore there's no more incentives to give. Which the numbers don't make sense because if I if I remember the two zero one six numbers correctly, the official numbers, mm -hmm. that is uh, twelve thousand five hundred houses that have solar panels in the country. 
Let's round it up so we use easy numbers. Say 10,000 houses. Mm. I believe that on average, a house is selling 500 ringgit a month. On average. Okay, they're earning 500 ringgit a month. 6,000 a year. 6,000 times 10,000 houses is 60 million. So the government collects 600 million a year and pays 60 million. What happened to the 540 million? Okay, fine. All right. There's also the larger, you know, installations. Let's take a let's knock off another 60 million, 120 million. What happened to the 480 million? So there, the um. Anyways, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but I'm just saying that the numbers don't add up, right? Right. And what you, would it take? What would it take for solar power to take off in this way without any sort of tax breaks or subsidies or how much would the price have to fall and is this realistic do you see it happen so i i'm i i'm a dreamer uh, aaron i'm a dreamer and i'm i'm a believer that okay because of what bitcoin was able to do i believe that if this is an incentivization problem what if i what if we could what if imagine okay if we could replicate what bitcoin did but just the opposite imagine okay that there is a game theoretically sound incentivization model in the form of a cryptocurrency similar to bitcoin but does the opposite in the sense that anywhere in the world if you have solar panels you can earn this crypto and it is uh, well, you, you can you can earn bitcoin with solar powers right can't you mine with solar powers how how efficient would that be is it viable? Does it happen anywhere? I think that um, uh, using so so here's the thing, okay. Uh, using solar using solar power, okay, to mine Bitcoin. Uh, there's a lot of people that that do that, but I think the majority when people say that. When you read those articles, like seventy percent, okay, of uh, all Bitcoin mining is powered by renewable energy, is not true solar power. It's usually no, true. It's, it's usually hydro, but could it be done with solar power? I would say that um, the technology is still not there yet. I would say, based on the current technology that we have, okay, it's still not there yet. Again. It comes back okay to it comes back okay to uh, incentivization. The reason why I, I would like to see okay whether is it done by me or whether is it done by anyone else. The reason why I would love to see okay a new cryptocurrency that is for this purpose that incentivizes people to generate solar, right? Uh, is because People are driven by, by financial incentives. And currently, government incentives throughout the world okay, have been proven ineffective in action, uh, doing long-term impact. So like, like Malaysia, what happened was that uh, for six years, we had very, very good business. It was thriving. And then the moment okay, that the incentives stopped, nobody bought solar panels already. Mm -hmm. Nobody bought solar panels. But imagine, imagine if like, what you asked the question, what would it take in order for us to, to see? So mm -hmm. it would take something external, something new, something okay, that is, I believe, okay, it would take a, uh, an incentive, okay, to imagine if I incentivize three installing solar panels. Right? You're, you're breaking up, Jason. Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah, hello? I'm still here, but you're breaking All up right. a bit. Uh, I apologize um, for the uh, not very good internet connection, but I will that. Okay, imagine okay that imagine the same is now that you can earn money. It's like mining. Okay, it's like mining a new cryptocurrency because of your solar electricity generation. You get what I mean? Imagine, okay, now that you can earn money and you're incentivized and you're motivated to do that, then more people would want to basically install solar panels. And for the first time ever, okay, uh, just like how when people mine Bitcoin, they need to compete, 
and they need to um, they need to always constantly upgrade their equipment. Imagine yeah, the, a game that's coming here. Hang on, this. If, for this, for this, for there to be an incentive, someone has to pay for it, right? Even if you make a cryptocurrency, it's not like the value comes out of nothing. Someone's gonna have to put up. Someone's gonna have to value it for some reason. So someone's gonna have to pay for it. I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, I, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work for Bitcoin. But then, if you put up a different currency, it, it would work. It either works for any any energy requiring currency or none of them, right? So here's here's the funny thing, okay? Um, for me, I, I get it, okay? I I I'm, I the the story of okay this project that I embarked three years ago called Empower did not launch, and part of the reason it did not launch was because um, I realized okay that. Um, I realized that there's a lot of things that can be learned from Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin got to where it is because not because okay that there was an ICO or you know um, none of that. Okay, Bitcoin happened because somebody somebody named Satoshi Nakamoto written a code and he put a lot of thought okay into making sure that this is something which how do I say. Um, can be sound money, okay? That there was no double spend, okay? Um, there was a there was a very firm model behind it. I am, I believe, okay, that um, the the whole reason, okay, why Bitcoin, okay, has value is because it has proven that it can it can be resilient, okay, to 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 attacks, mm -hmm. okay, and and that's what it is. I'm trying to. I believe, okay, that we need to create something like that. We need to create another Bitcoin. I'm. I'm saying it right now. We need to create another Bitcoin. I know, okay, that a lot of people say that uh, it's impossible to create another Bitcoin. But the part of the reason, okay, why Bitcoin is where it is today, also, is because nobody actually thought that it's going to succeed as well. So, um, you asked me the question, what is required in order to, to actually see more adoption in renewable energy? And currently, I'm convinced based on my experience, just based on my experience, that it is an incentivization problem. Okay. Um, I, I agree with that. Yeah, it's an incentivization problem. And... Um, if you say that Bitcoin is the incentive, then who's paying the Bitcoin? Do you get what I mean? Do you get what I mean? So what if this new cryptocurrency can be the incentive? It, it, so just like how miners, just like how miners, okay, in the Bitcoin network, they are incentivized, okay, by Bitcoin, right? To actually, uh, what's that? What if we can replicate? I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that I have all the answers. Okay, this is probably going to be something that I'll work on for the next 50 years of my life. Okay, to make happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. The whole reason, okay, why I I I'm not going to give up on this. Okay, uh, Aaron is because, um, I believe, okay, that uh, I I believe that. Um, number one, I, I strongly believe that this is possible is always is always impossible until it gets done, you know. And there are clues, okay, that they're just left behind for us to just pick up, right? What what got me okay into all of this actually was um, when in two zero one six when I left when the when the government stopped giving the incentives, right? Uh, nobody was buying solar panels, and I decided to leave. I decided to exit the solar power industry, like a lot of people. And I went to do other things. Okay, I went to work for a social media company. I went to work for. Um, I went to work for a social media company. I went to work for a crowdfunding company. And 
I learned a lot of new skills and all that. But I also went through what I think I went through a uh, kind of like a midlife crisis kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was asking myself the question, Jason, was the last eight years of your life wasted? You ran a solar power company for eight years. Can you not repurpose that for something else, right? And then it came on to me, right, that I asked myself, what is the reason we need solar panels in the first place? I came to the realization that actually when I was running a solar power company, I wasn't doing it for the environment. I was doing it what? for two reasons. I was doing it for uh, one is because for vanity. I like telling people back then I was young. I like telling people that I work for a solar power company. Number two, uh, I did it because the money wasn't bad. But then mm -hmm. I realized, just honestly speaking, reflecting, I'm, I wasn't doing it for the environment, and I can, and I don't think a lot of people are as well. So then oh, I started. I I, I think the world would completely change if sun power, solar power would catch on. Not just the environment, but it's just, you know, all the resource wars would become obsolete. But because, you know, why, why fight wars for oil if you can get energy from solar power? The petrodollar, you know, where is that going to get its value from if, if people don't need to buy oil as much? Uh, it's it's very decentralized, so it's it, it has that sort of uh, ideal in common with Bitcoin. You don't rely on some central party to provide you with energy. You can just generate it yourself through your roof. I, I think it would be probably the biggest game changer other than Bitcoin that, that the world could see if it would get to a sort of price efficiency to compete with other sources of energy. The price efficiency will need to come, okay, number one, it, remember, you said two things that were correct, price and efficiency, right? The reason, okay, that the efficiency is not good is because the price is not good. And the price mm -hmm. is not good, okay, because the higher the efficiency, the price is not good. So, again, I, 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 I see it, I, um, Aaron, I, I see it so clearly, it's just that I do not know how to get that. That, that part yeah. is not clear, okay? I see, okay, and I see, okay, how people are motivated by, uh, you know, back in 2017, back then when Bitcoin mining was still, you know, people still could compete for a little bit. They were buying graphic cards off the shelves, and then if you go to the computer store, you see empty shelves. Okay, and they will constantly go and say that, you know, give me the best graphic card, right? That's currently not, imagine that happening for solar panels. That's not happening for solar panels right now. You know, because there is no global, open globalist. There isn't an incentivization model in the world that um, that actually does that. Okay, where people actually go out and say that. You know, but imagine if it exists. If it exists and it functions and it works, then people will be going to the shops and says that, hey, you, you run a solar power company, right? Give me some solar panels and don't give me the cheap China stuff. Give me the best stuff, you know? And then they keep demanding. Imagine, okay, people going to the stores and say, what's the latest model, okay, the solar panels? What is Tesla up to? Or what is this company? Or what is that company coming? What's the latest thing? So until the incentivization model actually gets solved, this is not going to happen. Innovation is not going to thrive. You're going to have, you're going to continue seeing, okay, on social media, okay, that uh, this, uh, Oh, look at this solar panel. It's translucent. It can be used on your window. But people cannot afford it. They're, because nobody is, nobody is driven okay, mm. for that. So th this All is... Right, Jason. Uh, yeah. I think we're pushing about an hour. That's, that's about as long as I want my podcast to be. So we need more incentives for some solar power. I keep saying sun power because that's how it translates in Dutch. We just say sun power, but in English it's solar power. So yeah, Jason, thanks, thanks for being on. Let's hope uh, this incentive problem will be fixed somehow. I don't believe a cryptocurrency is gonna fix it, but maybe, maybe you'll prove me wrong. I hope to. Yeah, what's that? Uh, you know, for for me, it's like um, it's 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 a to me, it's like if I can contribute. Okay, um, even just a little bit in this area, 
okay um to move us in the direction okay that way we can actually see ourselves by solving this problem okay i, I think that it will be a yeah it'll be a, a, a I would say that I uh, it will be uh, a life worth living for for me. So, um, you know, to me it's like that. There's so many problems in the world. Okay, uh, I just so happen decided that this is the problem that I want to solve. You know, um, I know that currently what I'm doing right now is not in, you know running events and education, but um, I two things will happen i'm convinced okay that the world is um living on borrowed time so if we don't solve the problem soon enough okay then it, things will happen the things will unfold anyway okay so i'm just going to give my all so thanks for having me aaron thanks okay. for being thanks for being on jason yeah have a good night okay and uh yeah okay um Next time, okay, that we talk, I would like to learn more about you. Sure. All right. Cheers.